James Storm came out, said hi to make him, talked about how great the South was. He said he wanted his tombstone someday to read, Son, Brother, Father, Beer Drinker, World Champion. That would be a goddamn awesome tombstone. I can argue with this. Especially if it was shaped like a beer bottle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He rambled on for a while. He called out Bobby Roode. They explained how Roode got screwed at the pay-per-view, and Roode gave James Storm credit for thinking of the Beer Money name, the Beer Money merchandise, and said he got them over. And he thanked Storm for his second chance in his career. He said they should steal the show tonight. Can you steal the show if you're the main event? Well, sure. I'm just asking. They vowed to have a good match. You could steal the show if you're anywhere on the card. I just thought the main event was expected to steal the show. Well, if... if uh, Who are you if, stealing it from? Well, maybe Austin Aries had the best match on the show. Then you got to steal it away from him. I see. We had Gail Kim and Madison Rain versus Tara and Brooke Tessmacher. This yes. is the best entrance of all time. That's all I can say. If, if you could watch this entrance and uh, turn away from the television, then you are a stronger man than I. So after doing this fantastic entrance, they uh, then proceeded to wrestle. And they wrestled this tag match like it was 1988, and they were the, well, I was going to say the Rockers. They weren't that good. But they were doing arm ringers and arm drags. They were the Cockers. Drags. Oh, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing arm drags and arm ringers and quick tags and all this stuff, and got the heat on Brooke, and she made a hot tag to Tara, and Tara ran wild, and she hit the Widow's Peak. But Karen, Karen the Giant, took the referee. Karen is remarkably tall. <laughs> yes. And uh, Gail hit her finisher. She hit Eat Defeat on Tara. <laughs> and uh, Madison Pinder, and so they were new champs. Eat Defeat. Yeah. Still can't get over that one. So after th this tag team title change was so momentous that we had to go backstage for a Garrett Bischoff promo. Which, by the way, when they announced that the tag team titles had changed hands, I was like, huh, What? I'd forgotten the belts existed. I forget who had them. Yeah, they don't matter. I couldn't believe the championships were on the line here. It's quite amazing. I believe these belts were created exclusively so the beautiful people could wear them, and now the beautiful people don't exist, and the belts are still around. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Whatever happened to uh, the real skinny one, Angelina? Still around, as far as I know. Mm. Still hanging out with Winter. For a while. People just randomly appear and disappear on this show. Like today, just when Matt Morgan came out to call out Crimson, it's like, have I seen you two since Bound for Glory? No. Just randomly I, appeared I after three weeks or something. Garrett Bischoff got a promo. He said he's going to apologize to his father, but he's going to apologize his way. Which, in hindsight, his way is a shitty, shitty way to apologize. You know, the thing with Garrett here that I noticed, this last week he just seemed like he was completely nervous, out of his league, and, and, uh, and hopeless. I don't want to say hopeless. I don't know if he had no hope, but at the moment he was hopeless. This week it was like... I don't know what their idea was for this particular promo, but he came off as a 22-year-old uh, heel Matt Hardy with a better haircut. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's, that is not strong praise. Mm, that's just what I thought when I saw him. So they went to the commercial. When they came back, Garrett was in the ring. He called out his father. He began to apologize. He said, I'm sorry I disappointed you. I'm sorry I'm not the man. I have not grown into the man you want me to be. At which point Eric said... There's still hope. That was like one of the funniest lines in wrestling history. It was quite awesome. Because he's, he's, he meant it sincerely. Eric Bischoff was not making a joke here. He was letting his son know there was still hope for him to grow into the man that Eric wanted him to be. So finally, Garrett says, I'm sorry I didn't do this years ago. And he laid out his dad with a punch and got the mount and leading ground and pound until Immortal finally saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bischoff then, after taking 20 or so punches to the, to the face leapt to his feet, and he called his son a son of a bitch several times. Then went to commercial. So, Eric called his son... A son of a bitch. A son of a bitch. So Eric's wife then, by, you know, through, through the uh, transitive property here, must be a bitch. I guess so. Or Eric is. Hmm. Or, or Garrett's adopted. These are the only, only three possibilities. Interesting. Samoa Joe and Sting had a meeting backstage... <laughs> Joe demanded respect and dignity. God knows what he has done to deserve this in this company. He uh, hinted that if Sting, uh, that if he, he hinted that if he and Sting did not get along, there would be violence. To which Sting replied, "Quote: 
If Stinger's not nice to Joe, Joe's going to kill somebody. Copy. I don't know why. I thought that was funny. So Joe left. Bischoff and Flair arrived. They explained that Sting can't fire them because they made sure before they were deposed to get ironclad contracts for themselves. Yeah. I guess this guarantees them my spot on TV. I just like the idea that they have ironclad contracts, Mm -hmm. but Bischoff has given Sting the opportunity to, I guess, renegotiate. Rewrite, he said. Rewrite? Well, it's not ironclad, then, is it? I guess they're only ironclad one way. By the way, the uh, uh, the cock photo here at the Facebook page, uh, the name of the company that the, produces these geezers running the contra- contest is CTRL Industries. And uh, moments ago, they commented on uh, on her planking photo. You know what they said? Nice cock. I wish. That chicken is awesome. It's <laughs> actually a better comment. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen this photo, there is literally a a giant gaudy cock right here by the side of a busy road. Over your wife. Yes. It's 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 uh it's unbelievable the size of this this chicken. And uh Lucy Vaughn Party Pizza just uh gave us a thumbs up. So big thank you to uh to Mr. uh, uh Batboy as well. All right, go on. Anywho, yeah, they, uh, they demanded a match pitting Garrett against somebody of Eric's choosing, and if Sting got them this match, they would be willing to rewrite their contracts so theoretically he could fire them. Sting said this was intriguing, and he would get back to them. Daniels was backstage. He is still insisting that he beat AJ Styles, and AJ used some special effects trick to make it sound like he quit. He's also demanding, demanding uh, insisting, I should say, that he... Audio tomfoolery. That's what he said, yes, audio mm-hmm. tomfoolery. He's also insisting that he beat Bob Van Dam. He is demanding a title shot. Eventually, it was revealed that Bob Van Dam was standing behind him. Eddie Brawl. I originally wrote they brawled for days. When I thought about it, that was not fair. There are many brawls longer than this on TNA. They just brawled too long. And finally, Daniels ran away. And Rob said, I will see you at Turning Point. So apparently, they're having a pay-per-view match. Mm. Austin Aries versus Jesse Sorensen. God, Austin killed this guy. Austin's great. <laughs> He's great in a way that I would never have a match with him ever. Yeah, he did. Uh, when he hit his tope, he drove him as hard as he could into the guardrail. Kid Cash is on commentary, actually doing a fantastic job, uh, talking about Sorensen and how he has no respect and d- doesn't uh, treat him like a legend, or as a legend as he should. Mm-hmm. And then he, he did a spot right before the tope where uh, Jesse Sorensen tried to Pescado, and Austin just stepped aside, and Jesse crashed and burned to the floor. At which point, Kid Cash asked a great question. Why would you jump out of a perfectly good wrestling ring unless it's on fire? (laughs) I don't have a good answer for that. There is no good answer to that one. So they went back and forth. It was a good match. And Jesse won with a roll-up out of nowhere. They said it was non-title. So Jesse went to the back to celebrate his win. Kid Cash and Austin Aries left to find him together and theoretically beat the fuck out of him. Hmm. We had clips of uh, Rude and Storm talking about how badly they wanted to wrestle each other for the world title. We had uh, Robbie E. And last week I said that Rob Terry should be Robbie T. He is now. So thumbs up to TNA for that. Robbie E. and Robbie T. came down to the ring. Robbie T. was wearing an amazing shirt. That's all I can say. So Robbie E. called out Eric Young and Ronnie from Jersey Shore. They came out, got in the ring. Robbie E. started cutting a promo on Ronnie, saying, Jersey Shore sucks, you suck. Ronnie stood up for himself. It quickly turned into a brawl. The heels got the better of things. They tossed Eric Young out of the ring, and then Big Rob held Ronnie from Jersey Shore as Little Rob whipped him with his belt, and then they left away cackling, leaving the baby faces laying. So let it be known that in the first week of November 2011, factually, no one can argue this, TNA did a better job of booking a tag match with Ronnie from Jersey Shore than WWE did booking an appearance by The Rock. That's true. This is fact. That no is, one can argue this. That is a fact. Now, the problem, however, is it's Ronnie from Jersey Shore. That is a problem. With Eric Young, Robbie E., and Rob Terry. Of course. As we've learned a million times, celebrities don't work in wrestling unless, A, they're big-name celebrities... 
or B and B, actually. Both of these things have to happen. They have to be a big-name celebrity, and they have to be paired with a big star. Yes. A minor celebrity paired with a minor star, or Eric Young, is just not going to work. And worse, this is what's this is the worst thing about it. They were just doing a, a low-level uh, celebrity with a low-level wrestler. Fine. You make this mistake all the time, you lose some money, whatever. But the be-all and end-all in TNA is ratings. So why would you use a Jersey Shore star on a TV show that airs not only on the same night, but head-to-head with Jersey Shore? I don't have an answer. (laughs) As if to say, hello, the real show is on the other channel right now. Yeah. Astounding. They've done this numerous times yeah, now. Yeah, of course. Because, then, yeah, yeah. So, eventually, uh, the faces just stopped selling, got to their feet, and Eric Young cut a promo, and uh, he said he would check this with Sting later, but he was booking the tag match. So, next week, it will be Robbie T and Robbie E versus Eric Young and Ronnie from Jersey Shore. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just, I just, I was just amazed that... Uh, ablaze? Amazed. That's what I was trying to say. I don't believe I was ablaze. I was on your couch, so hopefully I was not ablaze. But, uh, yeah, they, they even showed a replay of this, which TNA, TNA never does. So, while your point about it being a C-list celebrity with a C-list TNA guy, all that is valid, I'm going to give the segment a thumbs up. Mm. Fuck your your cat. cat. <laughs> God, Jesus. this cat's driving me nuts. Maybe your cat's ablaze. Same cat that got sucked down into the, the quicksand of the mattress. We had Molly Ray and Jeff Jarrett versus Mr. Anderson and Jeff Hardy. Should it matter? I, I, I kind of feel stupid for even caring about this, but why am I watching Jeff Jarrett wrestle Jeff Hardy before their pay-per-view match? Well, Vinny, because it's still TNA okay. at its core. All right. There you go. So they had a tag match. The, yes, uh, Jeff Hardy was wrestling Jeff Jarrett. No one. It, it was completely meaningless. It was just two, two guys wrestling. Got the heat on Jeff. They worked him over. The highlight of which was Buddy Ray screaming at him, quote, Die, you freaking drug addict. That's what he said. Which, you know, if, Ray, if you're just patient, it'll happen. Oh, Vinny, that's that's what happens. He's, he's turning his life around. They had a short match. It was fine. The finish, uh, the Anderson made his comeback. They leave the heels out, and they teased a double senton from opposite corners. I was terrified they were going to crash into each other, but thank God the uh, Scott Steiner ran out for the DQ, and the heels set their finishes on them to build to their separate singles matches at the pay-per-view. This was... It was not good. It was okay. Sting got a hold of Garrett Bischoff. He's told him that, uh, he just said, look, if uh, if you wrestle a match next week against an opponent of Eric's choosing, I'll be able to rewrite their contract. And Garrett said, okay. To which Sting said, you know, never mind. <laughs> I changed my mind. Yeah, he, I, I, yeah, so Garrett begged him then to have a match, and Sting said, okay, and I guess it's for next week. Whatever. <laughs> Matt Morgan came out, called out Crimson. Morgan said he had seen a lot of notes on Twitter. People wanted to know if he could beat up Crimson. Morgan said this is a stupid question. He was the best seven footer in wrestling. A lie. <laughs> so so let me get this straight. Yeah. <laughs> in real life, people asking Morgan on Twitter if he can beat up Crimson. That's stupid. But apparently also in the fake world of wrestling, people asking if Mike Morgan can beat up Twitter, that's also stupid. Apparently. So basically, it's just stupid no matter what. <laughs> I think you're right. I'm yes. sick of hearing about Twitter and wrestling, by it, the way. It's awfully annoying. So uh, he said he respected Crimson, but he wanted to prove he was the better man. He offered to give the fans a dream match. That's the words he used, everyone. Dream match. Matt Morgan versus Crimson. More like a nightmare match. Whose dream is this? So Crimson accepted. He vowed to remain undefeated, and he left. Actually, if that match took place in the promotion dream, I'd pay for it. Is that a... uh, Matt Morgan versus Crimson in a shoot? I was going to say, that's a shoot league, right? Yes. Yes. That would be something else. Yes, Vinny, that is a shoot league. I don't fucking know. Good thing you edit my newsletter every week. Spell check. Oh, my. <laughs> so, yes, Crimson accepted. He vowed to remain undefeated. This is a good segment. 
aside from the Twitter bullshit, Morgan said, he said, listen, I like you, but I think I can beat you. Kim said, said, fuck off, you can't beat me. We'll fight. Done. We had the main event, and they actually got to be the main event this week. Robert Roode versus James Storm for the world title. This match was awesome. That's all I got to say. This match was awesome because uh, I was watching this, and uh, about uh, three quarters of the way through, my blood was starting to boil because, you know, obviously the whole thing is just rushed, as we've been talking about for a while. Yeah. Changed their mind. Then they threw the belt on Storm. Then they decided here they're going to throw the belt on Rude. And yeah. I just think they could have, you know, you could have done a storyline with Rude getting the belt at Bound for Glory. And then maybe you do a storyline where where he loses the belt, but he's promised a rematch. But in the meantime, Storm happens to get a, an impromptu title match for whatever reason, and he wins the title. They could have done a million things. And then you've got another six months. And then finally yes. you have the, uh, the baby face match. And anyth- anyway, point was, I'm watching this. It's all rushed, and and I'm just sitting there, and and uh, they start out wrestling, and it's great, and uh, they're exchanging holds, and uh, then there's a point where they start exchanging punches, but you know they talked about it earlier, it's it's brotherly, uh, you know brothers fight, and uh, no one's cheating or anything like that, and and uh, they're starting to do the near falls at the end. And at that point, my blood started to boil because I thought, what the fuck is Rude's motivation? You know, it's too early. It makes no sense for him to turn on his friend. They've done nothing in this match to to, to give any indication why why Rude would turn on his friend. And you know he's going to turn on him at any second. And, and they're going to do it like some sort of... St- I was getting so pissed off at all the things that I thought they were going to do. And then what happened was... The ref was in the way, and he almost got bumped, but he didn't get bumped. And in order to avoid getting bumped, he dove outside and supposedly twisted his knee. Bobby Roode gets thrown outside. Bobby Roode is laying there trying to recover. And he looks up and he sees Storm's beer bottle. And he looks at it. And he looks at it. And then he looks over at the referee and the referee's down. And he looks back at the beer bottle. And then he looks in the ring... Then he looks back at the beer bottle, and then he picks up the beer bottle, he breaks it over Storm's head, and he covers him, the ref slides into the ring, counts to pin, Bobby Roode is a champion. And I thought that was so fucking awesome, because it was not a stupid story, where for absolutely no reason, Bobby Roode turned on his friend. The story is that Bobby Roode went into this match planning to beat his friend clean in a babyface match. But he ended up outside, the referee was down, and he looked up and he saw temptation. And he thought about it, and the temptation, the need to win this title was just too much for Bobby Roode. He could not resist his temptation, and in an unpremeditated act, he broke the beer bottle over Storm's head, and he got the pin. And, uh... It's actually, it's actually even better than you're giving credit for, giving it credit for because throughout this match, especially the second half of it, as it went into the near falls, Bobby Roode was dominating the near falls, but he couldn't keep him down. And every every two count, Roode would get more and more frustrated. And finally, he puts on the cross face, and he's reared back on his friend, friend, you know, putting this painful submission hold, painful submission hold on him, screaming, tap. Please tap. He wanted his friend to tap out so he could let him go. And eventually Storm got the ropes. And Rude was getting frustrated and pissed off and a little sad. And there was nothing he could do. And then it got to the moment you're talking about. And TNA, for once in their miserable existence, played something up for maximum dramatic effect. They did not rush this shot. They had multiple shots. They had a shot with the ref in the foreground, and then Rude and in the, in, Rude behind him, and then the beer bottle behind Rude, and you saw Rude do the slow burn turn over his shoulder. Then they had a camera on the other side with the beer right up front next to the camera, and in the background, Bobby Rude looking at it with a you know the wheels were turning in his head, and then he looked around. He got his bearings. He got a hold of the situations, and he made a decision, and he took his. Fate into his own hands, he cast his friendship aside, and he gained the world title. I thought there. I thought that this was a masterpiece. 
I thought literally this was one of the best things that TNA has ever done in 10 years as far as, as the story of a, of a big match. Yeah. And granted, I don't want to get too pissed off, but I mean, the fact they did this for free on television. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly. The fact that they, they, did, they did six months to a year of storylines in two weeks. Sure. It all could have been better. But given given what they did, and hey, let's be honest. If they were doing this on pay-per-view, 7,000 people would have seen it. <laughs> Maybe fifteen because it was a it was a big match and and uh, and such. But the point is, one and a half million people saw this, and uh, and uh, you know, again, this could have all been done better. You know, they could have stretched this out. This probably would have met even more a year from now. But uh, they rushed through it because that's what they do. But uh, given all of that, what they ended up doing with this uh, with this uh, match and the heel turn. And the way that everybody played their roles, I thought this was one of the best things they've ever done. I just thought it was absolutely awesome. A masterpiece. As far as uh, wrestling action and and big-time fights and stuff, this is not even close to the match of the year. But when you're talking about telling a story in a wrestling match, winner is them. Yeah. There you go. So uh, about two thumbs up for this, at least. If I had more thumbs, I'd give more thumbs up. It was uh, quite awesome. So if you have not seen Impact... It is uh, it is worth it to watch that main event and and uh, the way that they they did that finish. Uh, I have seen I can't even tell you how many shitty finishes I've seen in TNA over the years. Oh God! But uh, this was um, this may have been the best finish all year from uh, WWE or TNA. I'm trying to think of a finish that would have been better than this. Certainly nothing in WWE recently. Um, maybe I don't know. Maybe Undertaker and Triple H at Mania, but just because that was such a you know, a match being there live that everybody was just going absolutely crazy for. But they they did a, a fabulous job here. And uh, a large portion of that is Bobby Roode and James Storm, obviously. But, you know, they, they could have cut this all up in editing. They could have rushed through it. They could have done a lot of things. But they didn't. They let it slowly play out on television, and it was awesome. So, anyway, huge thumbs up to TNA for this uh, main event, uh, both the match and the angle. So there you go. It's your Impact Review, everybody. This show is so much better than Raw right now. Oh, God. It's not even funny. It is not even funny. No. Somebody on our board was was uh, saying something about how uh, I was still making fun of Impact and, and how, you know, I I, I, uh, I wouldn't admit that, that Impact was better. And I was like, have you not been listening to the show? <laughs> I've been saying this for uh, weeks now. Speaking of swearing... There may be a little tonight for this impact review. The impact was on. It wasn't the worst impact of all time. It was. It was. Uh, this was better. It's fine. Than like ninety percent of all impacts. It was the worst they've done at least in a month. Yeah. All right. There was some stuff on this show that I found to be dumb. There was stuff on this show that I found it to be unacceptable. Mm-hmm. For starters, well, that's not true because we always accept this show. Unfortunately. Because we watch it doesn't mean we accept it. The show opened with the uh, video package from last week, Bobby Roode winning the title. As usual, there is important stuff in these video packages that, you know, you, you put it first in the opening credits and uh, it's too, too easy to gloss over and doesn't have the impact it should. Bobby Roode in a post match promo after winning the title, he says, I made it happen, happen by myself. I am a true main eventer. It's mine! And uh, Storm was ranting backstage, and then finally he shoved the camera away. Actually, it was a hell of a video package. I thought this was awesome. Yeah. This was the best thing on the show. That's probably true. In fact, I'm sure that's true. Bobby Roode came out for a promo. He was the new world champion. Fans all hated him. He told the fans they would have done the same thing he did. He said, this was a generation of selfishness, and I am the leader of the new generation. Fans were chanting, Cowboy. As, uh, as Rude was talking, they showed Storm stampeding through the back, and everyone was trying to cut him off. Finally, he got out on the ramp, and security blocked his way, and uh, he beat them all up, including one poor slub who had to take a flip bump on the ramp and into a cameraman. That looked like it sucked. So he finally hit the ring. Bobby Rude, as he should have, ran the hell away. He was taunting James from the ramp, holding up his belt, and Sting came out in blue jeans, an Impact t-shirt, Sunglasses, no makeup, and gloves. Gloves. I don't know why he was wearing gloves either. And, and it makes me laugh every time. He booked the re- rematch for tonight, so we know he's not a good booker. Uh, Rude was pissed, realizing how stupid it was to have his world title match booked for tonight. Because the last thing this angle needed was to be fast-forwarded anymore. 
All I know is during this segment, my first... Well, not my first thought, but actually this was my first thought during the brawl. Remember about three weeks ago when Al Snow and D'Lo Brown had a fight? Yeah. That went nowhere. Yes, it did. <laughs> actually, uh, you were wrong when you said the video package was the best thing in the show. We got the best thing in the show right here, which was Don West in a horror movie. <laughs> this was pretty good. It turned out to be a commercial for ShopTNA.com. But it was so goddamn good, I think I may go to ShopTNA.com and buy something. Just to support the commercial. Wow. I've gone there to, well, to ShopTNA.com, and the first thing I see in their most popular items, under $5. <laughs> Shocking. You have, I guess these are posters? The poster of James Storm saying, Long Necks and Red Necks. Long Necks? It's a beer bottle. Oh, beer bottle. It's a poster of Bobby Roode. He's just standing there, and it says, Off the Chain. I bet that's a hot seller. There is what I suspect is a... Uh, it is rated five stars. Oh, normal price 99 cents, sale price 98 cents. <laughs> no. You save 1%. No. That's what it says. Hold on a second. I thought you were joking. No, but now I, I swear to God. <laughs> the, 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 you mean you can save one cent, Vinny? A penny. This is the first oh, thing no. that came up. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, do you, do you see down there where it says the, uh, well, uh, let's click on under $5. Oh, I like this one. This has to be a fucking rib. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Which one are you Jeff at? Hardy action figure, price thirty nine ninety nine. sale price thirty nine fifty nine. You save 1%, it says. You've got to be kidding me. I don't know what's happening. I'm in the under $5 section, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what I'm looking at. There's pictures, as I described. I don't know if these are posters, if these are 8x10s. I click on the item. It shows the in a large uh, JPEG. It has the price again. And under description, there's just an audio file. I assume this is uh, uh, Robert Rude's music. I click details. And it says, item number, MPS-off-chain. I click reviews. Has 20 ratings, average rating, five stars, one review, left by Paul, and then in parentheses, Morley, to distinguish him from all the other Pauls commenting on shopdna.com. Left today, actually, 641 this morning, and the entire review reads, in all caps, Hogan song, please. I cannot believe this shop zone, this shop TNA here. So, yeah, I don't know if these are 8x10s or they are big, giant posters. There's a Jeff Hardy poster that appears to be a self-portrait because it is painted and it sucks. I love this Impact Soft Shell Jacket. Now, I presume I could be wrong, but if you were selling one of these on the WWE.com site, I, I think you'd put it, like, on Randy Orton or on John Cena. No, they put it on Don West, who was a little fat... <laughs> Kind of goofy looking. Oh, God. But by God, he's in that fucking shell. There's E. I still can't get over it. You save 1%. Hulk Hogan action figure special. Price twenty nine ninety nine. Sell price twenty nine sixty nine. See, 1%, I, you know, if you're buying a brand new pickup truck, 1% is not small change. I am looking at a poster for 99 cents, and I can save a penny. I like this one here. All it says is six different action figures. Could I get a name? Could I get a description? Let me, let me click on it and okay. see what it tells me. Wait, there's... I, I, the, the prices that I'm quoting here, the 99 cents... Marked, oh, my God. Marked down to 98 cents. Yes. Those are only for James Storm and Robert Rude. I, okay, I guess it's because they're 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 old. The, these photos are old, and now they are, maybe they have new gimmicks or whatever, but... You can get one, for example, of Cookie, normally four ninety nine, marked down to one ninety seven. 
She is twice as much as the TNA champion. I love... I'm not making any of this up, everybody. This is literally the worst door I've ever seen. Six different action figures, it says. Manufacturer suggested retail price, $89.94. You get it for $39.59. A savings of 56%. The photo is six action figures. And the words, and I quote, Six random! You will receive six different action figures of your favorite TNA Impact superstars of our choice. <laughs> yeah. One of the six is guaranteed to be Hulk Hogan or Sting. You choose which one you want, Hulk or Sting, and we will guarantee you that you get the one you want, and then we will include five additional figures. Awesome. That's what it says in all caps. This is amazing. It's a Brian Kendrick photo. Looking, and there's just no other way to say this. He looks homosexual. Oh, Vinny. He just does. You're just He's, asking for trouble here today. It'd be, all of these photos are uh, studio shots, and there's Dixie Carter rolling around in the grass. Eric Bischoff wearing a t-shirt with his hands in his pockets. Mickey James Banner. This is awesome. There are four pages of this. Hang on. Rebel Spirit Skull. You can get a Murphy photo for four ninety nine. Oh wow. A Miss Tessmacher photo wherein her face is to the camera. An Orlando Jordan photo. Back to school pack. This is something I want to give my kids. To go along with our back to school sale, Shop Teen A wanted to give every student an opportunity to have impact with them throughout their day. You get either a black or a blue lunch cooler. Their choice, I believe. One impact ruler, which it's probably a swerve and the numbers are completely random. Ten impact wrestling pencils and one impact wrestling water bottle. Wow. And they spelled water with two T's. Not making this up. I was so into TNA for a couple of weeks there, and now I just realized what they are. (laughs) This is a clown show. There's a photo of Sting where it's... it's Okay, imagine a picture of Sting, and you took an eraser and erased everything but his face. And I mean, there's no hair, there's no ears, there's no neck. It's just Sting's face with his eyes staring at you creepily. Three stars rating for that one. Hmm. You can, for the low, low price of $0.99, cents, you can purchase the fortune theme. Where are you looking? On the under $5 section. Oh, I'm looking in just the regular... St- I'm looking in featured items. They have Jeff Hardy's theme, Another Me, for $0.99, cents, rating two stars. I must read a review of this. Another Jeff Hardy theme, rated three stars. Brown bag special. I can only imagine what this is. Oh, my God. I think we've talked about this before, but... Do you know the name of Dixie Carter's theme music? Uh, I've heard it before. I don't remember off the top of my head. The Man in Me. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Running with the Balls, Eric Bischoff Instrumental. Hmm. Yeah, this, uh, they are not making too much money. History of TNA Year One. Whole bunch of themes. Hmm. Bobby Lashley theme. All right, Vinny, that's enough of this. This is more interesting than Impact this week. No, this... TNA chip clips! This is falling off a cliff here. I can do this all day. Jeff Hardy wall art? Wow. Oh, here's this nice. Eric Young. (laughs) Who put this fucking site together? We've got a... uh, It's Eric Young, and he's in a t-shirt with two thumbs up, and the shirt says, I heart tag teaming. Yes. Okay. Now, underneath it, it says, I love tag teaming. Price starting at ten ninety nine, And going up? <laughs> down? Perhaps up for uh, for fatter men. And below it says, sale price starting at ten eighty eight. Oh, well then. What a deal. My God. You can get TNA guitar oh, picks. A TNA Christmas ornament. Wow. 
All right, Vinny, go yeah, back to actually, the Impact Review. Actually, a bunch review. of DVDs. All go right. back to the Impact Review. I've seen enough. That was fun. I've seen enough. TNA Black Bejeweled Women's Shirt. You can wear that to your favorite club. <laughs> Is that Jay Lethal? In the Bejeweled Women's Shirt? No, in the TNA Flex Fit Hat. There is a completely random man. Same with uh, TNA black hat with white logo. Who the fuck is that? I, I don't know. I'm looking at a different page. All right, go on, Vinny. Let's get let's get going here. Oh wait, hold on. One more, one more. TNA DVD board game. With the TNA with the DVD board game, you can use your favorite TNA superstars to have impact pay per view and specialty matches for cash rewards and championships. You'll, with uh, no apostrophe, encounter audio-visual challenges testing your observational skills and your TNA knowledge. Some of the DVD board game features are as follows. Unlimited gameplay, TNA video footage, TNA star and knockout cards, TNA photos, championship titles, game board, and TNA cash. Wow. Ah. All right, I've seen enough. Move on. Are you sure? I'm positive. I can take no more. You're sure. All right, one last thing. What are they selling for over $50? TNA Heavyweight Championship Collector's Belt, $2,750. You read that right. They're also selling uh, autographed Sting baseball bats for uh, $79, which are on sale. A Jeff Jarrett laser engraved guitar for $299. And... uh, a Matt Hardy autographed shirt worn plaque from Lockdown 2011. Oh, what more could you ask for? All right, I'm seriously done. I can take no more. Pope versus Crimson. I have been wondering where Pope went. Crimson tried to take the... Uh, remember about a month ago, Bobby Roode took a DDT and ended up balanced on top of his head? Mm-hmm. It was the greatest bump ever. Mm-hmm. Crimson tried the same thing tonight. Failed. Bobby Roode takes that bump and I think, wow, that was a great bump. Crimson tries it, and I think, spinal fusion. Inevitable. So, uh, Pope tried a springboard. It's tough when a guy is green, because he can't figure out, did he just take a great bump, or did he just kill himself? No, I had no doubt. This man killed himself. There was never a doubt in my mind about that. Pope tried a springboard something, but Crimson caught him and hit the uh, the uh, sky-high powerbomb, which they're calling the Red Sky for the win. It was fine. Gunner cut a promo backstage. He was wrestling Garrett Bischoff on the show. Talked about having respect for your father and vowed he was going to teach Garrett how to follow the chain of command. It's a good little promo. Yeah, a fine promo because you believed what he was saying as opposed to 95% of the promos nowadays where men are blatantly reading from bad yes, scripts. Yes, this, this was a man speaking from the heart as opposed to people reading cue cards that other people have written. Gunner versus Garrett Bischoff. They're trying to make Garrett a star, so he came out with no video and no music. Mistake. He can do about four moves. They are arm drags and hip tosses. and uh, Very rudimentary. Yeah. for li- Literally, first day of wrestling school stuff. He did these four things. He did not do them particularly well. And then Flair ran in and shoved the ref down for a DQ. Listen. They need to send this to man to Ohio Valley like yesterday. Every day. All you got to do, this is so easy. You have somebody hurt him, supposedly. He disappears from television. You send him to Ohio Valley for, I don't know, five years. <laughs> and he comes back and then you can push him. <laughs> when he, yeah. But seriously, you, 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 uh, you cannot... Listen, if anybody from TNA is listening, for the love of God, you cannot... Try to push this man. No. You can't. It's not going to work. It's I going guarantee. To, no, it's going to end so badly. It's going to... Uh, this will be the end of the career of this poor young fella. Yeah. Send him to Ohio Valley. Let him work a bunch of spot shows. Let him train all the time. He's a good-looking kid. He's got a good physique. There's potential there. But do not push him now. Send him to Ohio Valley. A year from now, you can try and bring him back. But do an injury angle... Send him away, have him come here, uh, come back next year, bound for glory, and there you go. So, like we said, they did about four moves, and then there was a DQ, and because of this, Sting gets to rewrite Eric's contract. And uh, neither Sting nor Eric had anything to say about this for the rest of the show. Of course not. Robbie E. and Robbie T. tried to get into Eric Young's locker room. 
He had a match with uh, Eric Young and Ronnie from Jersey Shore tonight. Uh, the gist of this was the Robbie E wanted the baby faces to back out of the match. They refused, and they shouted at each other, and that was that. They found James Storm bloody backstage. He had been severely beaten. Didn't know who had done it. My favorite part of this was uh, I could have sworn the guy that showed up screamed, Get Twitter! <laughs> but he actually said, Get the trainer. Which I'm not sure if that's better or worse. Oh, it's worse. <laughs> Get Twitter. <laughs> I swear to God I thought he said that. Zima Ion wrestled Jesse Sorensen. It was a next division match. It went like three minutes. It was an independent match. It was an independent match, yeah. J- Jesse won with some sort of weird reverse rolling neckbreaker thing. So Kid Cash comes down to the ring. This I hated. Okay. Kid Cash comes out, and he talks about how he'd never been given anything in his career. He'd fought, he'd scratched, he'd clawed for everything he'd been given. But tonight, he said, I'm going to give something to you, Jesse. What I'm going to give you is a championship match on Sunday. And I thought, you ain't the champ. So he explained that he had a contract. It had already been signed by two of the three participants, which would mean Austin Aries and Kid Cash, which raises the obvious question, why did Austin Aries decide to put his title on the line against two men on Sunday? But Cash demands he signs it. Uh, He demands Sorensen signs, Sorensen box, God knows why. So uh, he finally signs it, and Cash said, Jesse, your mom would be proud. Tell her thank you. Or tell her you're welcome. I don't even know what he said. All I know is I have absolutely no idea what was going on here. They got into a brawl. Austin Aries hit the ring. They double-teamed Sorensen. They kill him with a double underhook uh, pile driver. Uh, Cash kills him dead. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out what the hell's going on. So Aries and, and Cash are best buds. But Aries is still going to put his title on the line against two men in a three-way on Sunday for, like, no reason. Why would he do that? And and if he was going to, why didn't he come out with Cash in the first place then? I thought this segment Cash sucked. came down of his own accord alone. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this was lame. I, I, I assume their plan is to lure Jesse into a situation where they can legally beat him up two-on-one. But it sucked. The way he's been in this business all this time, and he hasn't even considered for one second that Cash, after they kill this guy, is going to want to beat him for the title. He, he may turn on him. It yeah, sucks. It was stupid. Karen's crew was shown hanging out backstage. We got Velvet and Mickey versus Gail Kim and Madison Rain. Velvet is the TNA Women's Champion. She is still no good. She's really bad. She is... Cute. I mean, Not a good sure, worker. Sure. Not she a is, good worker. And, uh... I mean, she, she she runs the ropes like 40 times better than Kelly Kelly, but it's still very bad. And uh, I liked how this match, they uh, go to the finish. Karen takes the ref, yeah. which allows Gail to hit, eat defeat on Velvet. And then, and then she calls over the ref and he counts the pin. And so if you're wondering why they had to distract the ref to set up eat defeat, I have no fucking idea. I kept trying to figure it out, and I have no idea. Because it's TNA. It did not play into the story of the match at all, except that they just wanted to have a ref bump or a ref distraction or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Gail beat her clean with her move, and I don't know what the ref uh, getting distracted had to do with a goddamn thing. But we'll get into that later. Uh, they were checking on Storm backstage. He said he didn't know who attacked him. He insisted he was fine. He tried to stand up, stumbled over. He was clearly not fine. Sting kept shouting at him, do you know what city we're in? Do you know what city we're in? And then it cut away immediately. Yeah. I kind of thought that this was an important twist in the biggest storyline of the company right now, but apparently not. It was much more important to go to the ring for Robbie E. and Robbie T. against Eric Young and Jersey Shore Ronnie, a goofy comedy match at the top of the hour featuring four dorks. Yeah. Yeah. I do like actually Robbie E and Robbie T as a as a mid card heel comedy team. I enjoy them. And then in this match we had yet another ref distraction, which led to nothing. <laughs> Who are the agents that well, put these matches together? Al Snow and D'Lo Brown. We have two matches with a bullshit referee spot 
then the time is going to come where you need to do a referee spot, and it's not going to matter at all because you do this bullshit referee spots all the time that lead to nothing. Yeah. Why do you not bump the referee or distract the referee or anything until you need it? So then it actually means something. I realize that these these are high concepts, but uh, it's really quite simple. As uh, who said that? Oh, it was, uh, Tony Schiavone, right? When he was explaining one of the wacky... Oh, uh, uh, Scott Hudson. Scott Hudson. In one of the TNA right. tournaments. Yeah, it's really quite simple. It's really quite, really quite simple, he Seven said. screens of rules. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, I also determined here, quickly, actually, that uh, Ronnie from Jersey Shore, superior to Garrett Bischoff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he had a good clothesline. He had a good body slam. The place went absolutely apeshit. Better shit. body. Eric did a flying uh, elbow, and Ronnie did the ultimate warrior splash and got the pin. Terry... Was supposed to try to hit the ring and get broken up, and that sort of happened. But uh, he actually stumbled right in front of the referee who didn't care, even though the referee had been distracted earlier in a spot that didn't mean anything. So, yeah, it's kind of a mess. The Bellator CEO joined the announce desk. Actually, you missed a whole segment here. That's been known to happen. Mexican America and Ink Ink and the girls all brawling backstage. I vaguely recall this. Yeah. Did I miss anything? I think it was the same angle they did last month. They're okay. just still brawling. All right. Same fight lasting yeah. for a month. Yeah. So after that crucial bit of storytelling, the Bellator CEO joined the announce desk. What's his name? I didn't write it down. <laughs> Bjorn Rebney. I just said Bellator CEO. If I, if I wrote Bjorn Nedney, I would not know who that was. Rebney. If I write Bellator CEO, I know it's the guy who runs Bellator. Well, learn his name because this is the number two MMA promotion in the entire world right now. So? <laughs> this will be newsworthy, Vinny. Pretend like you're doing your job here. Bjorn Rebney. Distant number two. Not really. They're going to be on Spike TV in uh, 2013. They're going to have the same... Uh, they're going to essentially have the same television deal that UFC has right now. That's yeah. kind of big, homie. I guess so. Yeah. Regardless, there was this guy there. They were talking about Bellator. Bellator, you're doing a fine job plugging his product for people who care. There was one bit of conversation that confused me. I guess they were talking about tournaments. But, uh, today or someone said that's what make, makes Bellator so unique in the, in the MMA world. When you move forward, you control your own destiny. How is that unique? Well, Vinny, you should understand this is a sports fan. Because you see, sometimes in, in UFC you can win fights, but you're not going to get a championship match. Sometimes you will, you will uh, have a long win streak, but you're so goddamn boring... That they'll do everything in their power not to give you a championship match. I see. Whereas in this tournament, if you win the tournament, then you just get a championship match. All you have to do is keep winning. And no matter how goddamn boring you are, or exciting you are, or whether you can talk or not, if you continue to win, you take your, your future into your own hands. I see. Yeah. Moreover, if this whole uh, win and move forward thing is so exciting, why doesn't pro wrestling give that a try? Because they're idiots. Okay. So uh, the, the the sports guy is out there to end in, to lend an air of legitimacy to this athletic competition here, and uh, at that point, Chris Daniels grabbed a screwdriver, not the drink, no, an actual tool, not his tool, a screwdriver. He jumps in the ring, or he climbs up in the apron, and uh, AJ is stumbling to his feet, and the referee has to stand there, and he has to not turn around because he's like between the two wrestlers. So, so has, the one time they could have used a ref bump or distraction, yes, they didn't. Correct. So Daniels is on the apron. Bob Van Dam runs out. He takes the screwdriver away. And then they're going to go right to the finish. So you think, okay, kick him, hit a Styles Clash win. No. AJ first has to hork him up in a fireman's carry, drop his neck over his knee, and then hit the Styles Clash. Mm -hmm. Just to hit one more move. Didn't get all his shit in. So, uh, yeah, we saw uh, attempted murder here and then just a wrestling finish. To the back! To the back. Bjorn Rebney didn't know that there would be no screwdrivers in Bellator. He was, he wanted everyone to know this. And no uh, brawling outside the cage, either. He also noted that AJ was 220 and thus would fight heavyweight. Well, that was hilarious. That is funny. We had a uh, six-man... Bully Ray, Scott Steiner, and Jeff Jarrett versus Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy, and a mystery partner. Mystery partner turned out to be Abyss. 
So they're having a six-man match. It is by the numbers. They're going through the motions. It is fine. And then Jeff Hardy, for no reason I can fathom, takes a super overhead slam from Scott Steiner. Just a giant bump that, for no reason, accomplished nothing. So there's a hot tag. Everyone hit a big move. Crowd got into it. And finally, Abyss pinned Steiner with the Black Hole Slam. Or excuse me, Abyss... Abyss, it was the uh, Abyss Pin Steiner with the uh, what they call it, the shock treatment. The shock treatment. Where he lifts you up a torture rack and then he drops to his ass, which is funny because the exact same time Abyss was lifting Scott Steiner onto his shoulders, your wife picked a cat up uh, onto her shoulders <laughs> in the exact same position. I have expected her to drop to her ass on the hardwood floor. It wouldn't have worked. No, your cat would have no sold it. This is a great little TV match by the end. Yeah, the, the fine, fine action. Babyface has celebrated the team of the monster. With no teeth. The asshole with no charisma. And the drug user. Well, former drug user, of course. Reformed drug user. Excuse sure. me. He did time for drugs. That's a fact. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. So we have the main event. Bobby Roode versus James Storm. Roode comes out. They play Storm's music. No Storm. Try Storm's music again. No Storm. Finally, he stumbles out there in the... Realistically, I guess, 90 minutes since he had been attacked. They had not toweled him off. <laughs> they had not put a band-aid on his head or even just wrapped tape over it. He comes stumbling down the ramp, bleeding profusely. And keep in mind, storyline earlier was they were stitching him up. Yes. <laughs> so they decided not to clean the blood off of his head. They were just going to stif- uh, stitch him up through the blood and then let him continue to just, I guess, I don't know, bleed or, see, yes, or there's dry there was, blood or no, well, I don't know what the, the, the problem blood was. The blood was fresh. It, it looked like he had gigged right before coming out. So let me know that TNA's doctor is a complete incompetent. He can't do anything right. That being said, James Storm looking at Robert Roode defiantly through a blood-soaked face was pretty cool. And, and a great visual. It's just preposterous. It was ridiculous. And silly and hard and impossible to take seriously. He did run by the camera and get blood on it. That's always a win. So Storm ran wild for a minute or two, and then uh, the blood loss got to him and he got woozy and passed out. Officials ran down. Referee checked on him. Rude was even concerned about his former friend who he'd broken a beer bottle over because he's so selfish. And uh, he helped the ref and they, 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 they helped Storm to his feet. And uh, Rude says, turns to the ref and says, by the way, the match is over, right? The ref says, what? Bobby says, the, the match is over. You, you rang the bell, right? The ref says, no, the match is not over. So Rude shrugs. He schoolboys Storm. The referee counts three. At this point, AJ and Kazarian run in and, Storm, and uh, Rude runs away. Why were they so angry at Bobby Roode? The match wasn't over. He used a wrestling hold to take his opponent down and pin his shoulders to the mat. He could have been a pile driver. He could have poked him in the eye. He had him totally helpless. And the ref and the match was going on. Yeah. That's all factual. Yes. Robert Roode did nothing wrong here. Well, if you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at the ref. Yes. Bobby Roode politely asked, is the match over? Yes. And this man was at his feet dead. Yes. And they were lifting his corpse to his feet, and the ref's like, nah, it's not over yet. I didn't ring the bell. Yes. I was like, I, nice. I should be mad. The people should be... AJ and Kazarian... Were they in Texas? Should be mad at the ref, yes. Hmm. So, uh... Anyway, Roode bailed, and... AJ issued a challenge for the pay-per-view, and... I guess things said it was on, and then it ended. Yeah. This was horrible. This was, in fact, the worst go home <laughs> build for a main event, I think, in history. When they, it was they over. Have, they have announced matches in the final segment of the show before. Mm-hmm. That, that's been done. Yeah. But in the final minute of the show, and they cut away as the match is being signed, and that's your go home main event angle, this set new standards. At the time this ended. I was not even sure the match was actually on. I had to check with you. Did, is the match official now? The match is official. Apparently Sting said, yes, it's going to happen. No one's buying this pay-per-view no. except me. This... <laughs> I'm the only one on the earth buying it. Well, maybe Dave. 
The show's going to do two buys. You and Dave. Yeah. No one else. I can't think of a single person in the world who's going to buy this pay-per-view other than the two of us. They announced the main event in the last minute of the show. And it's Bobby Roode versus AJ Styles. Granted, it's probably going to be a good match. Except yeah, AJ's a match. got a uh, busted up ankle. How is that? That doesn't help. Impact. The, the Impact pay-per-view. I, for the love of God, do not remember what it was called. I, turning, was it Turning I, Point? Dude, I have a file on my computer called TNA pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. The, name, the, the only name that has any bearing on that show, on those uh, ones is Lockdown because that's the Cage show. Otherwise, it's just TNA's monthly pay-per-view with a wacky name. And um, I was thinking about this today. We got no feedback to that TNA pay-per-view. <sighs> yeah. Like, none. Yeah. Nobody bought that show. And I was thinking about this. If it were like any other promotion, like WWE or UFC having a pay-per-view, then me coming on this show and saying, you know... Maybe Dragon Gate and Chikara took a bite out of the pay-per-view. It would be laughable. I was thinking about this today. I was thinking that uh, most likely the Chikara pay-per-view did about uh, 1,500 buys. I don't have numbers, but uh, the indications that I've been given are somewhere in that range. And I could be wrong. Just the impression that I was given. About 1500 which is actually very good for a first-ever uh, sure. internet pay-per-view. The first-ever ROHI pay-per-view, I think, did like 900 or 1,000. A very good number. And then the Dragon Gate USA shows, I don't know how many buys they did, but I know they were happy with the numbers this weekend. And so, between Chikara and three Dragon Gate USA pay-per-views, you got to think, when a TNA pay-per-view, this is not like WWE where a... a Bad WWE show is going to do like 100,000 buys. Maybe a little bit lower if it's really bad. Let's say between 80 and 100,000 uh, pay-per-view buys. 80,000 and 100,000. No way that Chikara and Dragon Gate USA takes a bite out of that. But when a show is only doing 7,000 buys, and only the hardest of the hardcore wrestling fans are actually buying the show... Then, if there are three other products, four other products, three Dragon Gate USA and one Chikara, that are appealing to that hardcore demographic, then that could, in fact, make the difference between a low buy rate and a record low buy rate. So that may have happened to TNA this weekend. TNA may have been affected by Dragon Gate USA and Chikara. It's amazing. It makes sense to me. It doesn't help that the build for this pay-per-view was god-awful. Yes. I mean, you, you listen, this is like beyond common sense. I mean, there's got to be something beyond common sense. Um, heredity? I, I would just say, uh, what's the opposite of common sense? Just stupidity. Genetics? It just is? I don't know. I'm no scientist. But the point is... <laughs> It's beyond the level of common sense not to announce your goddamn main event with 30 seconds left on the show. The go-home show. It is sabotage. That, that, that's it that's is, it whatever is it is beyond common suicide. sense. Uh, it's not suicide. Promotional it's not, suicide. Promotional suicide. No, it's not. Because because they weren't trying to kill their pay-per-view. They just didn't know what they were doing. That's impossible. No. It, they could not have thought... No. no, they do. They don't think. It's been better, but at the core, it's still TNA, everybody. Yeah. And and that's proven by announcing a pay-per-view main event in the last 30 seconds of the go-home show. Yeah, I don't know if you read the comment thread after Thursday's show, but someone pointed out, how could you guys have not talked about the scary music playing during the main event announcement? Because it went off the air immediately? Yes, because it, it started with the pay-per-view main event announcement, and the show was over five seconds later. Mm-hmm. That's why we didn't mention it. So, we may as well talk about that TNA pay-per-view. All right. Why waste time? Talk about this god-awful show. Oh, why waste time? Then why do we watch it? Actually, this... to be honest, let's be honest, everybody. The show was not god-awful. No. It was just really boring. It was very boring and very pointless. Very pointless. Uh, I think I think I liked it more than, from what I have read, and as you noted, it's pretty much you, me, and Dave that saw it. I think I liked it a little more than you guys did, but was it any more better than a typical SmackDown? No. Was it any more memorable than a typical SmackDown? Hell no. Just some stuff that happened. You have, oh, wait, this is the wrong damn file. I have opened the Impact file, not the Impact pay-per-view file. Yeah, they're largely the same. I, I, how long do you think if I had not read the file name, we would have gotten in there? Show opened with a video of uh, the stock market. 
God. Warfare. Oh, my God. Lying presidents, crying children, and beer money. Uh Uh-huh. Don't ask me. Well, what it was was they were comparing the Bobby Roode heel turn to corruption, pain... Devastation. Poverty, and devastation, yes. Yes. Lovely. uh, This was not their best work. Overdramatic. We had Eric Young versus Robbie E., Eric Young, Eric Young's new gimmick is he wants to do fake lockups with everyone, including the fans. Gimmick sucks. They did a long sleeper spot. Eric took his pants off, revealing trunks that said GTW, which is Robbie E's gimmick. So I figured this would make them friends. Instead, they fought more. And he stripped to even tighter trunks. He had a big dive under both Robs. And uh, then uh, Robbie T tripped him on the apron. He took a nasty bump onto the apron and then on the floor. And he got thrown into the ring, and Robbie E. pinned him to win the title. It was fine. To win the title. There's a title. I forget which title it is. A TV title. What's the other one he's got? Eric Young. I actually have no earthly idea. Eric Young walks around with the two titles. I think well, one, one is the old world title he pulled out of the garbage can, if I recall correctly. I don't know if it's got a name. Hmm. Because mm-hmm. I remember there was a belt. There was, they called it the Legends Belt that Booker just w- gave himself. I thought that became, like, the TV title. I think that is the TV title. I have it no idea what the other matter. one is. You know. Doesn't matter. It showed AJ Styles and Bobby Roode arriving for the main event, which most people may not have known. We had a mixed six person tag match with the tag titles on the line. Of course. Mexican America, the tag champs, since nobody can remember that. And uh, uh, Sarita versus Ink, Ink, and Toxine. They had a tag match. It built up to the girls uh, getting the hot tag, and they looked fine. Not particularly good, but fine. They went through a lot of trouble at the end. You know, this uh, started, I shouldn't say it started, but one of the, the big angle on this was the tattoo parlor brawl where they supposedly gave uh, Anarchy a tattoo on his ass. And I have been trying to reveal it since then. And uh, they pulled his trunks down here and the ass tattoo was on TV for about half a second. Yeah, what's frustrating about this is, I don't know, maybe it's just like we had a bad string of, well, it was two straight days. But um, actually it was on this show. It was his entire show. I was thinking of Raw, but Raw was a different kind of stupidity. It was his entire show. This show was a show where all up and down the program, there was a bunch of stuff that was that sounded, I'm sure, great on paper. But in execution, it sucked. You know? Wrestling, I don't think, used to be like this. Like, when we watch WWE Classics on Demand, when, when somebody has an idea in a match, it usually is pulled off pretty well. Every idea they had in every match on the show was pulled off horribly. I'm sure on paper it was a great idea that at the end of the match you're going to pull down Anarchy as pants and show the tattoo on his ass that he got without his permission months back in an angle. But in execution, it was just a mess. It was a complete mess. Didn't look good. He was out of position. They kind of got it. There were too many people in the ring. It was just real fast. They, the announcers frantically tried to explain what was happening. He had to finish. Yeah. It was a mess. Yeah, somewhere in here, Sarita pinned Toxine with a belt shot. This match was slightly better than the opener. Had a three-way. Austin Aries defending his uh, X title against Kid Cash and Jesse Sorensen. Gimmick was, the two heels openly said it was going to be a handicap match with themselves beating up Jesse and teaching him some respect. And, uh, well, that was the gimmick. I and mean, that's what they did. Jesse Sorensen uh, is a good athlete. He can do some good moves who the crowd does not give one shit about. No. He is not over in any way. And why should he be? So uh, they beat him up for a while. He made some comebacks without uh, not much. And uh, other than uh, sometimes Cash would make a cover and Austin would have to remind him, hey, hey, that's not the plan. Because, of course, if Cash gets the pin, then, then Austin loses his belt. So then the payoff to all of this is that uh, eventually Cash hit Sorensen with his terrifying double underhook pile driver. Aries, very sneaky, put Sorensen's foot on the ropes. So could Cash show up confused and then Aries pinned him with a roll up. A roll up. So, presumably, this will build to Kid Cash versus Austin Aries. Mm. Which means, again, you have to pay to watch a match that is just, uh, that is not the end of a feud. It's the start. Yeah. AJ Styles got a promo, said he would win. Daniels versus Bob Van Dam. Booked to be an ODQ match for no good reason. Daniels come out and cut a promo saying there is no good reason for this to be an ODQ match. He said, let's just do a straight wrestling match. And Bob said, as usual, whatever. So uh, they advertised no DQ, then took it away. They did some wrestling. 
Daniels went to leave. Taz had this advice for Chris Daniels, and this is good advice for all young wrestlers out there. Avoid any kind of flip dive. <laughs> yes. Got it. So, uh, yeah, Daniels went to leave, RVD went to get him, and then Daniels changed his mind, and he grabbed a chair. So, of course, you had the lying heel who got Rob to agree to not cheat, and he cheated, and uh, he threw a chair into the ring. Actually, the finish was really good. He threw the chair into the ring, and he got a screwdriver. He held up the screwdriver like a maniac who was about to murder this man, and he got into the ring, and he went to hit RVD with a screwdriver, but Rob blocked it with a chair, then threw the chair at uh, uh, Daniels for the Van Daminator, and then jumped up into the five-star frog splash for the pin. That actually was a hell of a finish. Rob Van Dam is slower than Continental Drift at this point. Which is not good. And it's not good for anyone. For and him. doesn't exist, I've been told. For him that's especially. A, another matter entirely. Let's not even get into that because I don't want... I don't know. We had a promo by the uh, the Robbies. Robbie E and Robbie T. Well, really Robbie E. The Robbie, just, Robbie T just stood there being big. He uh, said that he, they were the biggest stars and had the bling to prove it. He vowed to be TV champ for a long time. Said he was jacked and would do whatever he wanted. He said, bling equals bitches, and it was time to hit the club. Which would have been a great skit. Sure. They should have sent Robbie E. and his TV title to a club to hit on girls. Sure. God, that would have been awesome. Crimson versus Matt Morgan. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. It was not horrible. It was fine on paper. It was not the worst thing it I ever saw. sucked in execution. Yeah. They, uh, that's right. Okay. They, I expected worse from this. They had an, they were having an okay match. They started doing finishers and near falls and kickouts and all that. And then after hitting all their big moves, they then agreed to stand in the middle of the ring and trade punches, which is a cool spot at the wrong point in the match. And they punch each other and they smile and then punch. The other guy would hit a punch and the victim would smile and they do this for a while. And they try to do a hockey fight. And the ref tried to break it up, and they shoved him down for the double DQ. Yep. That part sucked. Mm -hmm. They could have had the undefeated Crimson get a win here and still build to a rematch in a million different ways, but they went with this one. You know what this leads, don't you? They're going to team up again? They win the tag titles. Do they? Thursday. That was actually just my guess, because this is TNA and it's how they work. Yeah. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. Wacky tag team partners who don't get along. Where have we seen that before? Well, apparently they're friends now, I think. Who knows? Scott Steiner and Bully Ray cut a great promo. Scott started to talk, and uh, I don't know if he lost his train of thought or started to stumble, but Bully Ray cut him off and said, just flex. <laughs> so Ray talked for a while. Then Steiner said this is going to be easy. He went to parts unknown. He found Abyss's girlfriend. He learned all of Abyss's weaknesses. They talked about flexing and going on dates and great tag teams. And uh, Steiner warned Bully Ray about Abyss's girlfriend because, quote, she's fat. This is the best thing in the entire show. So we had Bully Ray and Scott Steiner versus Abyss and Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson at this point really, really sucks. He's given up. He's He would be below average in Tulalip. I don't know if he's... Well, he was, he was better than the worst guy in Jakarta, but not by much. He was uh, looked bad. And so, of course, he was in the ring the entire time. And uh, this... Mr. Anderson being a shitty wrestler in the ring, being beaten up by two men, resulted in chants of, We want Steiner! Mm -hmm. Yeah. At this point, in fact... What a baby face in peril. I'm not sure. I think Anderson may be fatter than Bully Ray. They tried to coordinate a false tag with Bully Ray and Scott Steiner, who have had thousands and thousands and thousands of tag team matches between them, and it took forever to get this set up, and it came off looking bad. So Abyss finally ran wild, which resulted in more chance of Steiner... The hell happened at the end here? Who cares? It was a nothing match on a pay per view. Abyss pinned Steiner with a black hole slam. Yes. Okay, there. Then they put him through a table, and he totally no sold it, and they said the monster is back. And my question is if he's a monster who can go through a table and not sell it, why did it take him so long to win? You're asking the wrong fella. I, these questions are rhetorical because it's, because it's TNA. Or, or better yet, our old standby, why not? Why not? Karen and her crew cut a promo. They established that Gail needed no help to win. Gail Kim versus Velvet Sky. Oh, God. Velvet Sky is no good. She uh, easily... Well, no. Kelly Kelly is still... Hmm. Kelly runs the ropes badly, and then she does not hit them at all. 
Velvet actually runs worse than Kelly. She's the worst rope runner I've seen. It's, it's, it's close between the two of them going back to the early days of Nigel McGuinness. Velvet here did the 14 steps to run halfway across the ring bit. This show was going along okay until the tag match, then it went completely off the rails, and I don't think it ever recovered. Madison, Madison ran into his ran, meh. Madison ran into that was his a move. good uh, recreation of this match. Actually, it was. Madison ran into his move. The crowd chanted, you fucked up at her. Velvet kicked out, which pissed me off because I wanted the match to be over. Gail missed a drop kick. Looks look like she killed herself. There were more near falls, more interference, and finally Gail won with eight defeat. This match sucked in every way. Bischoff was on the phone. He blamed his wife for their son. Said something about taking care of him Thursday night. Mother Ray was freaked out by Abyss. Bischoff was surprised to hear that Abyss had been put through a table, so he doesn't watch the show either. He had uh, Jeff Jarrett versus Jeff Hardy. I was looking forward to this, and then Jeff Hardy pinned him in five seconds. So they started wrestling again. I guess it was restarted. There was no heat, because the crowd already saw Jeff Hardy win. A few minutes later, he had, the, he had a small package out of a figure four to win again. To which Taz replied, quote, When my man shows up, he's tough to beat. <laughs> so Jeff went to leave. Jeff Hardy went to leave. Jarrett hit him with an unprotected chair shot to the head in 2011. Mm. Amazing. He threw him in the street, threw him in the ring, and hit a stroke. Ordered the ref to count, and as the ref was counting, Hardy rolled up Jarrett and pinned him for a third time. And the only good thing in this entire segment, Jeff's reaction to this third pinfall. Jeff Jarrett instantly underwent, underwent a paradigm shift. His worldview twisted on its axis, and he could not handle this change. That's the only way I can describe this. Yeah, it was the only, it made the whole thing worthwhile. You know. <sighs> Go on. Hardy went backstage. All the baby faces like him now, even AJ. Rude was taking credit for uh, Beer Money's success. I gotta just be fair here. I gotta be honest. I don't ever want to see anyone take an unprotected chair shot to the head again. But I really couldn't be outraged about this one. I'm not gonna lie. Because in reality, um, if you said, Brian, one man in the world has got to hit you in the head with an unprotected chair shot. Jeff Jarrett would be, like, in my top three. This was not... The only two above him would be, like, uh, Jerry Lawler and maybe, like, Hulk Hogan. Hogan, I, I'm pretty sure if he tried to give me an unprotected chair shot of the head, he'd miss. <laughs> there is that. Lawler, Lawler would, would make so little contact that uh, I, I would probably have to... Uh, I'd have to keep my eyes open to make sure it got close to my head. And, uh, and, and Jarrett, I'm pretty sure... Uh, I think it's a safe bet that uh, that Jeff Hardy was okay after this chair shot. But this, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I, I don't ever want to see anyone take an unprotected chair shot to the head just to be safe. This was not Balls Mahoney bending a chair over a man's head. No. This was the safest it could be done. You shouldn't be hitting the head with chairs, but there, there used to be the deal where, where when you hit a guy in the head with a chair, you weren't really hitting him hard in the head with a chair right you know and in the last 10 15 years that whole thing just went clear out the window about 20 years actually and guys just hit people in the head as hard as they possibly could with chairs you ever watch bruiser brody swing a chair i'm sure he probably killed people actually at least the one i'm thinking of because there's actually there's probably many times when he did kill people but other times he would swing the thing at an angle and then the other guy would put a shoulder into it and he'd swing it hard but then would just like glance off the guy sure it was safe, is my point. And it looked good, and the crowd went crazy. And I, I think that in the last uh, dozen or so years, all these these wrestlers that want to tell the world that they're tough here in this... this uh, hate to say it, but I was a wrestler, people. Sports fake. Um, you know, they'd say you can't fake a chair shot. That was always the, the catchphrase for like the past 15, 20 years. But the reality is, if you're a good worker, you can fake a chair shot. You know? You really can. And uh, I'm 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 pretty sure that uh, that Jeff Jarrett, the the force with which he hit Jeff Hardy with this chair shot to the head was probably similar to the force that uh, who was it that hit the turnbuckle like a complete idiot on this show? Was it Velvet? I believe it was Velvet. Velvet probably suffered more brain damage hitting the the turnbuckle on this show than than Jeff Hardy did from this chair shot. With all that said, I don't need to see chair shots ever again in wrestling, but I need to be fair about it. So we have the main event. It is unfair to, to compare Jeff uh, Jarrett to Balls Mahoney. That, that's not fair. All right. Had the main event. Bobby Roode versus AJ Styles. You won't believe this, Brian. But nobody gave a shit. 
No, they didn't. This was a surprise empty arena match with uh, empty seats disguised as fans. It was just dead, dead, dead crowd. When they didn't make noise, it was often because they still wanted to cheer for Rude. So AJ did a 450 land on his face. It's always a bad idea. Just no reaction to anything they did, no matter how hard they worked. And eventually, Rude reversed a Styles Clash into a roll-up and pulled the tights to win. This match failed. Yep. So, you know where that leads. A rematch. Uh, an Iron Man match at the uh, oh, next pay-per-view. Wow. Because God knows... Ah. To be fair, I mean, part of the problem was that AJ Styles was injured. Let's be honest. And sure. uh, a healthy AJ Styles is probably going to have a uh, a pretty damn good match with uh, Bobby Roode. That would be my guess. So there you go. That was the, the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. Impact over with Bobby Roode coming out. He's still a champion. He said he was the star of Fortune. Everyone else was crap. He was not going to let them stand in his shadow. Storm came out on the ramp, and I thought this was a missed opportunity. He should have still been bleeding. Because he was not cleaned up in two hours. Why? What? Seven more days. But he was not. He was just up in street clothes. And he said that he was going to find out. Well, at first he said he was going to take out Bobby Roode for uh, attacking him in a locker room and leaving him bloody. And before he could attack, Roode said, now come on now, I'd, I did not take you out. I have a locker room full of witnesses. This says, I was sitting in the back minding my own business when you were attacked. Storm said, well, I'll kick your ass anyway, and uh, security dragged him away, and as they did, AJ Styles appeared in the ring, he attacked uh, Rude, they brawled, and they were separated, they went to commercial, and they came back, and you think, okay, we're going to move on to something else now, and no, they were still in the ring. Oh my god. Hold on a second. Granny sent me an email. Exactly one minute, one minute, before we called her. You know what it says, Vinny? I don't know what it says, Brian. It says, what time? Now, Vinny, do you know any old people that when they send you an email, there's a, there they have to add in a, a uh, like a, some sort of smiley? I've seen some of these, a, yes. a series of smileys? Sure. Maybe smileys and flowers and hearts? She added a smiley of a Pac-Man on his back, howling with laughter. Why she added this, I have no earthly idea. Why did she add this laughing Pac-Man when she asked what time? Now, the graphic of this laughing Pac-Man only comes up when you open the email. So, when you just open up your Gmail and you have your list of emails and they've got the subject line and then the first line of the email, you know what I'm talking about? I do. In that preview, they don't show you the cartoon character. You know what they do? What do they do, Brian? They write out the description of what that character is. Well, what was the description of this character? Point of this is, when I opened up my uh, Gmail here and I saw my list of emails, I see an email from Gladys Gibson which says, and I quote, no subject, and then follows that with, rolling on the floor, what time? <laughs> that, that, that's funny, Brian. <laughs> yeah! That is high comedy and hilarity. You may proceed. I'm not sure I want to. It would have been a lot funnier the first time, but it that's all right. probably would have. It's a comedy. You just don't give up. You keep trying, and it gets funny at the end. Are you sure? <laughs> Any evidence of this? If I tell this joke one more time, it's probably not going to be funny. But if I pull it out one more time again before the end of the show, it probably still won't be funny. But if I try it a third time after this, everyone's going to laugh. You actually are probably right about that. I'm not going to do that, though. Because we wouldn't be laughing, and that's the whole goal of the show is to entertain ourselves. Yes, I want to go to bed. So continue. So they came back from break, and AJ and uh, Rude were still in the ring. Rude said, I already beat you. You go to the back of the line. I beat you all night long. Steen came out and said, well, if you can beat AJ all night long, let's have a 30-minute Iron Man match for the next pay-per-view. Stink. And with those words, this is already a better build than the last pay-per-view had. They went from the last 30 seconds of the show on the Go Home show announcing mm -hmm. the pay-per-view main event to on the first show of the new cycle, they announced it in the first 15 minutes. Exactly. Hmm. That's good! Yes. <laughs> That's good only because they did I it so bad I never thought I would time. have to praise somebody for this, but it's true. 
So, uh, everyone separated. It looked like it was finally going to end. But no, there is more. Bobby Roode, for Christ knows what reason, went after Dixie Carter in the crowd. AJ tried to save her, and it somehow ended with AJ taking a belt shot, falling on top of Dixie, and then Roode uh, lit into AJ with punches as AJ lay on Dixie's corpse. I'm not a fan of the word mark, really, but uh, I love how Dixie Carter just sits in the crowd like a mark. I like Vince McMahon is always working on something or yeah. busy or making whatever or doing whatever backstage or Dana White who's doing whatever. I guess Dana sits and watches the shows too, but he's working the rest of the time. I don't know what Dixie's doing the rest of the time. I don't believe work. Joe was backstage. Or excuse me, uh, James Storm was backstage. Samoa Joe approached him. He wanted to vouch for Bobby Roode. He said he was watching Bobby Roode the entire time and Roode didn't attack him in the shower. And so... Storm said, well, maybe you did. And Joe says, if it was if it was me, you'd have never gotten up and they had a brawl. This happened, like, literally seconds after Dixie Carter fell down and was being beaten on. Yeah. They just cut away. Well, we've established no one backstage ever actually watches what's going on in the ring or, or ringside. Isn't it kind of important that Dixie Carter took a bump and a man fell on top of her and another man was beaten on the first man who was on top of a fallen Dixie Carter? Apparently not. Shouldn't that be, like, the biggest angle in the last 10 years it of was, impact? It was never mentioned again. No one cared. It was mentioned one more time. On with the show. Uh, in fact, right here, uh, Sting tracked Bobby Roode down. He said, you should never put your hands on Dixie Carter. That's like putting your hands on me. Actually, Sting is much worse. You are a big guy. Dixie is a small woman. So That's why this was the goddamn stupidest impact segment maybe all year long. Listen. What happened was they're going over all this stuff, and Dixie... Or, I'm sorry, uh, Sting shoves Rude, and Rude ends up saying, if you lay one more hand on me, my lawyers will sue you for everything you've got. And I thought, really? Really? So, you're going to do the fucking storyline that Sting isn't allowed to touch Rude or Rude will sue. Meanwhile, Rude grabbed and manhandled the female non-wrestler owner of the company, causing her to fall down, get fallen on, and he was beaten on this guy on top of her. And she ain't going to file suit? This ain't ever going to be mentioned again? Stupid. This sucked. Speaking of things that suck, Devon versus Robbie E. Not these two men, I like them both, but... This is a two-minute match that involved interference by, my count, by five men. Yep. If you can get five men to interfere and uh, have it easy to keep track of, you're a better man than I. I just wrote down the names of those involved. You couldn't even put five beans on a card in 20 minutes. No. <laughs> Fine point. Pope was involved. Rob Terry was involved. Eric Young was involved. Both of Devon's kids were involved. It accomplished nothing. Robbie E. won. For those of you who keep track of this kind of thing, you may update your records. This was shit. Sting talked to Garrett Bischoff. Garrett wanted a rematch with Gunner. Sting said last week he gave Garrett a match with Gunner, but it was a snap decision. Really? It was. He thought about it for a full hour. I could have sworn you had the offer made to you, and then you had to spend a, yeah, you had to spend a lot of time tracking Gunner down to make this decision. And then he rescinded it, and Gunner, Gunner talked him into it. Yeah. They don't even remember their storyline from last week. From seven even days ago. Even we remember this. What does that tell you? I remember this. Yeah. So, uh, Sting said he would think about it. At this point, Crimson and Morgan walked in together all chummy, laughing about how hard they hit each other the night before, or the pay-per-view before. You know, the match where they had a pull-apart after the match as well. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Sting said, look, the machine guns are hurt. Team 3D split up. Beer money split up. We have no more tag teams. I need contenders, because if I don't get contenders from Mexican America, they're going to leave. I'm not making this up now. We have gone from getting title matches by attacking the champion after he's already been taken out, to getting title matches by cashing in a briefcase, to getting title matches by signing a petition, to getting title matches because there's no one left. Except people who hate each other. Yeah. So, that's what we got. They got a title match here, and... Uh, when Sting said that Mexican America said they had no competition, Crimson jumped forward and said, we'll take it. And Matt Morgan was reluctant, but he accepted as well. So you know eventually Morgan's going to turn heel, and aren't we just all waiting for that feud? Oh, Vinny, you're... No. They haven't even begun thinking about that. Sting found Flair and Bischoff. He said that after uh, last week's deal, the deal was that if, he, if uh, Sting put Garrett Bischoff in a match, then he would get to write, rewrite Eric Bischoff's contract. 
This was amazing. Bischoff said, that's true, but I never said anything about signing it, and he laughed. So Sting threatened him with physical violence. <laughs> think, think about this fucking segment, everybody. They spent two weeks building up a stipulation where if Sting put Garrett in the ring, he would be allowed to rewrite Eric's contract. Sting put the kid in the ring, and the whole payoff is that Eric said, fine, rewrite it, but I ain't signing it. They all went LOL, and then Sting said, well, I'll kick your ass. <laughs> yeah. This is some shit writing. So Sting then said that he could uh, he could kill Eric right now, but instead he is going to humiliate him by letting Garrett Bischoff become a bigger star than Eric ever was because Garrett can wrestle. You know, it's funny. I was listening to a comedian today. That is funny. And uh, some of you that have XM may have heard of this today, too. I may be telling it wrong. I'm not going to try and tell a joke, but it was a point that he made. He said, uh, <clears throat> I have uh, written five screenplays, he said. I've uh, sold five screenplays, sold five movies. And he was essentially saying that this, you know, this sounds exotic. This sounds this sounds uh, really cool. You know, this, this must be a, a famous guy. He wrote all these screenplays for movies. And he said, this is really a shit job. He goes, I write these screenplays. And then it's like two years of getting a thousand notes. And he said, an example of a note I will get is they will send me a note saying, in your script here, uh, in this scene, this girl eats uh, peanuts. And then later in this scene, she's wearing a hat. Do these things make sense? He's pointing out how preposterous it is, this is, you know? They look at every single solitary thing in your script to make sure that it makes sense. That's Hollywood. Look at this shit on impact. Anything passes for, uh, any of these scripts are overseen by nobody. Right. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's amazing. When people are like, oh, hey, it's just mindless. It's just like any other... Te- no, it's not like any other television show. No, it's like any movie. This fucking script... This script would have been in development for this impact. This development... Uh, this script would have been in development for like a thousand years in Hollywood. If Vince Russo would have submitted the script. If it were not just immediately burned in a trash can. Anyway, you can continue. Oscar this storyline sucks. Kid Cash versus Jesse Sorensen and the uh, sadly still employed Brian Kendrick. Aries and Cash were not getting along. Aries refused to tag in at one point, which is funny because Sorensen was down at this point, but he refused to tag in. Then later he just did. And finally the heels were slapping each other to tag in, and Aries finally slapped Cash and left. And he said into the camera, quote, You want to be a dick? Go be a dick in there. So Cash was left alone, and Sorensen soon pinned him with his wacky neckbreaker. Mm-hmm. Had a wacky segment with Karen and her women. She congratulated Gail, gave her the night off. She ordered Madison to take someone out, and then she and uh, had Tracy give them champagne, and they drank it. You know, <clears throat> it's kind of amazing. Or not at all, actually. When I say it's kind of amazing, I'm being sarcastic. It's kind of amazing that... Uh, Alex Shelley is, in fact, not hurt. He's sitting at home doing jack shit. And meanwhile, God bless her and all, but Tracy Brooks is on this show every single week, and her entire role is to display her tits. Yeah. That is literally... they In storyline. They paid her... To, for a single comedy gag, where she was dressed head to toe in black, and she turned around and there was a giant square in the middle of her outfit so that her tits could poke through. They brought her in and they paid her for that, exclusively. Mm -hmm. She was not in a match. No. She did not have a speaking role. She had absolutely nothing to do on this show. Except show her boobs to the world. Astonishing. Storm met with Mr. Anderson, accused him of being the attacker. Hey, Mr. Anderson, you can guess how annoying this was. An amazing segment. We had a knockout gauntlet. I'll be honest. I used my timer. They said we were going to have a 10 knockout gauntlet match for the number one contendership. And I thought, well, this will last six minutes. It actually lasted 12 minutes and 30 seconds, 
which amazed the shit out. And that's not counting a commercial break. Yeah. So realistically, they spent 15 minutes on a 10-person gauntlet match. Which realistically we should not is be praising them for still this. one one minute and, and uh, eight seconds or so per person. Yes, <laughs> but still the first I expected a good twenty seconds per person. Well, the uh, you for two women you were right. Rosita pinned Velvet. Excuse me, Velvet pinned Rosita in ten seconds. Then she pinned Brooke in thirty, and then from there I think we all went uh, one to two, maybe three minutes. But if you must know the order of elimination, Velvet pinned Rosita. Velvet pinned Brooke. Angelina pinned Velvet. Angelina looks like a skeleton. Still does, yes. Uh, Mickey pinned Angelina. Then Sarita. Then Tara. Then Winter. Then ODB. And uh, ODB was second to last. Mickey pinned her in a minute. ODB beat her up afterwards, left the lane. So Madison's coming down to the ring. She is smiling. She's waving to fans. She's all happy she's going to win. And she gets in the ring finally, and Mickey immediately rolls her up and pins her. So Mickey is the number one contender. Here's my question. Was the plan for Karen and Gail that Madison would win the number one contender and go on to challenge Gail for the title? Oh, I think the idea would be that uh, Madison would win and then not ask for the title shot. Just just pass. So Gail would not have to defend. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 uh, I got to give it a thumbs up overall because, I mean, we just saw a uh, WWE pay-per-view a while ago where... Somebody was just awarded a title shot for literally no good reason. We see that all the time. They actually won the number one contenders match after it had been announced they were getting the shot. Yeah, they see that too. That's that too. But at least they like you know they they did a ten woman gauntlet match. Everyone had a chance. One woman beat six women or whatever, and uh, now she gets her title shot. Great. Only thing I didn't like about this, and it's uh, it's actually the fault of uh, Taz and no one else, is uh, Mickey beats like three straight girls. And then she's on her knees, gasping. And Taz goes, this is when conditioning begins to play a factor. And I was like, she's been in the ring for three minutes. Yeah. That was lame. Bully Ray was backstage yelling at a woman with orange hair. Don't know who she was or why she had orange hair. but Bubba Ray a rat. Would, would not go out with her. Dismissed her and uh, Storm arrived. They did the same segment with different guys throughout the show. Strong would accuse someone of attacking him. That person would deny it, but they would say they know who did it or whatever. Ray invited Storm to join a mortal. Storm did not join a mortal. Jeff Hardy came out. He said uh, it was time for him to focus on his world title, getting that back. And Karen came out, she said, to put him in, in his place. And all I know about this segment is that Karen Jarrett's voice was, I can't even say nails on a chalkboard. Just screeching and squealing and shrieking. Hate and, that shrieking. And she started stumbling over her words. It was very bad. Started this, talking about how she knew Jeff's wife and she said he couldn't deliver the goods or seal the deal. This was awful. This was good for like 10 seconds. And then she went from great heel to just mega massive. Not just turn the channel, but like unplug my cable box seat. Yeah. It is the worst. So, uh. Absolute goddamn worst. Eventually, Jeff Jarrett attacked, and Hardy fought him off. And this is, again, one of those TNA things. They can't just have a fight and have one guy win. Jarrett attacks, but Hardy sees him coming and turns around and scares him off. So then Karen tries a low blow. But Hardy blocks that. So then Jeff Jarrett attacks and he gets the upper hand. But then Jeff Hardy reverses it and eventually he fights them both off. Jesus Christ. So what do we need to see a match for? I don't know. I don't know. This was no good. Mexican America cut a brief promo about how they're going to win. And I, I, in all sincerity, I really do believe they said they are strong like a chupacabra. Yeah, they did. Okay, it's not just me. No. Oh. Player was backstage with Gunner. Told him to hurt Garrett and make a name for himself. We had uh, Mexican America versus Crimson and Morgan. This was when I realized that Garrett Bischoff was getting the main event slot. I think indeed he was. Yeah. Yeah. Main eventer, everyone. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. They had a match. It was fine. It was fine. Uh, they did. You know, we, we talk about bullshit finishes all the time. By the end of this, Crimson clotheslined Hernandez over the top rope. He turned around and hit Anarchia with the uh, exploder, and Anarchia got to his feet and ate the carbon footprint for the clean pin. A dominant finish. Good. Yeah, exactly. Very he, good. A, a, one team won and one team lost. Thumbs up. What we want. So, yes, this is a thumbs up segment. 
Although Crimson is a baby face in peril, it's tough to get sympathy. Better him than Morgan. <laughs> yeah, I guess. All right. So we have, yes, the main event, Garrett Bischoff versus Gunner. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think that, like, uh, I, I, I've, I've said uh, nice things about Garrett. You know, he's a good-looking fella. Mm-hmm. He looks like he works out. But uh, you put him in the ring with Gunner, and it's like, we used to make fun of Gunner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Gunner looked let's like, be fair. Uh, For the vast majority of his time here, we've made fun of his name. It is, it is mostly his name, yes. Well, when I, once he's got actually gotten a chance to wrestle, he's usually been pretty good. Gunner in this match, it was like a professional fucking wrestler <laughs> against a backyarder. That's what this was like. Well, yeah. And uh, maybe someday Garrett will be something, but right now he looks like a backyarder. Well, he took some decent bumps. He threw some decent punches. He throws punches better than half the guys in all companies. He threw a jumping, flying double sledge. That was awesome. That's... He uh, he looked better than last week. He looked he looked a lot better. Well, he did more than last week. Last week, all he did was a two arm drags and hip toss. But they weren't but, the, and not very well. But uh, his selling needs a ton of work. Yeah, uh, he's very very green. Like I said, he looks like a backyarder. He's got a lot of way to go. But there's there's listen, there's hope for Gunner or for uh, well, I mean the Gunner's doing fine. There's hope for Garrett. You know, I don't know how much hope, but there's certainly hope for him. I see more potential in Garrett Bischoff than I do in Mason Ryan. Yeah, but they're going to badly fuck up both, both. guys. <laughs> As a matter of fact, so but yes, uh, you, you just they're they're going to push gear too hard, too fast. Ain't going to work. You know, it's just it's inevitable. You know, I mean, how long are we watching Eric Bischoff? Obviously, he's going to push his kid too hard, too fast. But you know, the kid has hope. We'll see what happens. But uh, I predict quite the backlash here. Maybe they'll just turn him heel at that point. Think they're going to make another rock. Good luck with that one. Hmm, that's your idea. <laughs> Hmm, that's all I can say. But he won. He won. I think, believe he hit a DDT and won. So, Storm came down to the ring. He said he did not know who attacked him, so he was going to blame everyone in the locker room. At this point, he called out AJ Styles. AJ came out confused, and Storm pointed out that since he had been attacked, AJ had weaseled his way into not one, but two title matches. True fact. AJ was outraged that he would be accused of such a heinous act. And uh, they shoved each other, and there's tension until finally Kazarian came out to make peace. He shoved them both. And he finally agreed to, or he finally got them to calm down, and he convinced AJ to leave and let cooler heads prevail. So Kazarian and AJ left, and uh, Storm was going up the ramp when <laughs> it's actually a little funny because Kurt Angle came out from under the ring, and the camera showed this. The camera was on the ramp looking down at Storm, and then behind him in the ring, so you could see, see Angle come out and. Angle came out from under the ring and came up, to, uh, came up behind Storm for a good five seconds before the announcers even said anything. Well, they're busy watching... And reading the script. I don't know. Yeah, that's probably what they're doing, to yeah. be honest. So, uh, Angle attacked him, beat him up for a while, threw him in the ring, beat him up more, and uh, he revealed that he was the one who attacked him and uh, said, you can go tell your daughter that Kurt Angle gave you a concussion. And that was the end of the show. Hey, that's two uh, big main events for the next show, so uh, thumbs up for that. Some good, some bad on the show. Overall, it's fine. Better than Raw. Better than Raw. Definitely better than Raw. Better than Raw. Hmm. Which is kind of fitting when you think about it. All right, well, let's get moving here. Impact opened with, in all seriousness, one of the best recap videos they've ever done. It's, uh, usually, if you watch the Impact recaps, they have just been a mess, a, a, a jangled mess of, incom- of uh, incomprehension. This made it quite clear what happened last week. If you had never seen the show before, you, you would understand the plot of last week's show perfectly. So thumbs up for that. Angle came out, said he didn't attack Storm from behind. Storm just didn't see him coming. So Storm came out, and this is something that WWE does too, and I hate it there too. But you have two guys who are just starting a feud, and they have one guy attacked the, one, attacked the other backstage and cost him his world title, and here they are face-to-face, and they just talk. They don't fight. They just talk. So, that, on that hand, it was, it was stupid. On the other hand, James Storm was talking some serious shit. So, that was good. James Storm is the best. He was talking about how he was not afraid to take an ass whip and get a broken neck. He'd come back for more. They argued about who screwed who out of the world title. And Storm was finally ready to fight. So, Angle called out his crew, which was Daniels and Jarrett and Bully Ray. And it was four on one. And so, Storm landed a shot and bailed. And you think, okay... 
Segment over. Mission accomplished. But no, there is more. The faces all ran out. AJ Styles, uh, Rob Van Dam, and most importantly here, Mr. Anderson. There's a brawl going on, and everyone pairs off and goes to a corner, and I believe Anderson was with Daniels, and he looked like he was throwing punches underwater. You should have seen him run into the ring. This dude's hurt or something. Maybe he is. He can't run. Let's give he's him, fat. I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt and assume he's injured and not just... I think he's injured. And not just uh, defeated. That's the uh, that's the conclusion I've come to is he's hurt. He's also got 33 on his ass, which I don't know if that's how many pounds he's gained since his uh, WWE heyday, but... Uh, yeah, it seems honestly conservative. Yeah. And this did. This was the usual TNA brawl. Uh, it just went on too long. You know, the whole idea is this brawl was to set up a match in the main event. So the whole idea is you leave people wanting more. You don't give them plenty. You know what I mean? Like, if I'm going to have a, a Thanksgiving dinner, I serve a, a small appetizer to whet the appetite. I don't go, here's a chicken. <laughs> just set up for your turkey? And then later we're going to have a, a turkey. Well, then you, sir, are doing Thanksgiving wrong. That's that's no, no, no. idiotic. Kidding. You go here. Here's a uh, here's here's a, a one olive, and then later I'm going to give you a whole turkey, and then people are like, "Oh my god, I can't wait." So anyway, they do this wrong all the time. I and mean, these guys just brawled and brawled and brawled and brawled and brawled, and then they send out their 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 dipshit security team, which of course never does anything. It's like, oh, let's just put more bodies out there to make it look even more wild. But it's not like security ever actually separates of anybody. Not. They just stand there and watch the violence. Yeah. It's like, so so you're being paid by Dixie Carter because uh, I need to start a security company and, and send out some of my buddies because they, they couldn't do any worse. Anyway, that was the opening segment. We had a wacky skit where Eric Young and a referee arrived in a bicycle thing with a turkey suit. I normally hate Eric Young segments. But uh, they were gold on this show. Uh, this one, this one was not. Yeah, there, there was a, there was a great one later, and I'm not talking about the match either. There was an amazing impact moment. This could only happen on the show. Last week, you recall, Sting told Crimson and Matt Morgan that he needed a tag team to face Mexican America because Mexican America said he had no competition. This week. We got to see the segment where Mexican America told him this. So rather than air the segment first and then discuss it, they discussed it and then showed it. Only A week on impact. later. A week later. Only on impact. So we had our rematch. Mexican America versus Crimson and Matt Morgan. The uh, tag champions destroyed them in the biggest squash on impact in ages. And my first thought is, hey, great. They're trying to push someone. That's fantastic. My only uh, uh, caveat to that is the whole point of them teaming up is that there are no other tag teams left. So now what do you do? That's a problem. That is a problem. Maybe they just leave Impact. I Sure. Maybe they'll retire the tag belts. We had a... <laughs> this is the segment that I loved. Eric Young and Rudy Charles met with Robbie E. and Robbie T. to explain to them that they were booked in the uh, Loser Wears a Turkey Suit match. Robbie E. wanted nothing to do with it. Eric Young said, Sting demanded it or you'll be stripped of the TV title. And so Robbie E. said, fine, and he stormed off. There was a lot more to it than that. And uh, to be honest, I would have hated this. But Rudy Charles was holding the turkey suit in his hands. And uh, even better, he was holding the turkey head and manipulating it like a puppet. <laughs> so the turkey was first poking Robbie E. in the chest. And then... Rob Terry came over to stare down the turkey, and the turkey stared back. This was awesome. Rudy Charles is no longer with the company. They brought him back for this one show. And when the show was over, it was like, uh, can Rudy Charles come back, like, every week? Of course. He was awesome. Every talented person gets fired. Karen and her crew came out, and then she caught out, like, a half dozen women. See, she said she had been trying to get the women to cover up, and she had failed... And it turned out that the men in the audience wanted to see more skin. She said, she said since Gail was the only real athlete there, she was booking a lingerie bowl, which I believe, I'm pretty sure that term is trademarked. But she uh, rambled on for a long time without adding anything. It was not her best promo. You know what sucked about this entire thing? Aside from the fact that it was, uh, actually there's a million things that sucked. <laughs> I was going to say. All right, here's everything that sucked. First off, 
this just went on forever in terms of this show. This segment went on forever. They had like two extra backstage segments about this match. Then they actually had the match, which went through a full commercial break and was the longest match of all time. That sucked. Second, the match like went past the top of the hour and into the next segment after the top of the hour and went a long, long time because they wanted a lot of fans to tune in to see it, right? Sure. So, the gimmick is the girls did not want to dress in the actual lingerie, so they wore more than they wear on a normal day, which means all those people that you were hoping to tune in and see the hot women, you were tuning in and see the hot women all covered head to toe in... Uh, in uh, Significantly more clothing than they usually wear. Yes. Now, the thing about the whole thing that, that infuriated me most of all was all I want in my wrestling is, like, logic... I just want my wrestling to make sense. I don't want to feel like an idiot when I watch my wrestling. So, this was an example where apparently they decided to do some thinking. But sometimes doing some thinking is even a bigger problem than not doing any thinking at all. So, it would have been really easy to just say, from now on, every year, we're going to have a Thanksgiving thong battle royal. And all of the girls are going to wear thongs, and they're going to have a match. Well, someone apparently said, well, wait a second. Why would these babyface women agree to degrade themselves on television and wear these thongs? That doesn't make sense. So, let's come up with something that does make sense. That being, let's have the babyfaces bitch about this. So... We, the viewer, who have been watching Impact now for 10 years, we had to watch Velvet fucking Sky come out and explain that she was appalled to have to wear her lingerie in a fucking wrestling match. The girl that humps the fucking ropes every time she gets into the ring cannot conceive of the idea of having to wrestle in lingerie. The girl that, as she's humping, vigorously fucking a ring rope, getting her the ring, she looks at the camera and points to her ass as if to say, wait, go around back and film my ass. This girl is appalled at the idea of having to wrestle in her lingerie on television, as is Brooke Tessmacher, who, as noted many times on this show, has a great ass, and TNA took forever to finally show it off. But how do we know she has a great ass? Because, in fact, she does lingerie modeling. She has done nude modeling. She she uh, takes photographs for a company called Vertical Smiles, for Christ's sake. This girl had to explain that she was above wrestling in her lingerie. This was beyond preposterous. This was so far beyond preposterous that... I don't know. Okay, you're, you're overlooking something with the test mocker. Don't forget, in storyline, this woman was a whore. That's right. There, the character of Brooke Tessmacher was a woman who used her body to uh, an exchange of sexual favors for whatever she needed from Eric Bischoff at the time. Mm-hmm. Now she's an athlete. So now, yes, and again, she is and supposed to be uh, appalled at the idea of wrestling in, in, in less than regulation gear. And might I add... There were three segments of these girls bitching about having to wear lingerie for this match. And then the very first fucking thing they did was they came out, they exposed their lingerie, which, as noted, was more than they normally wear in a match. But then they got up on the top rope and they started shaking their tits and shaking their ass. They didn't mind being degraded then. This was idiotic. This was, And the match sucked a cock! Now, before, and, and one other thing before we get there... Just think about this segment for a while. This is what actually happened. Karen said the fans wanted to see more skin. And she said it in a way that maybe was she the, the character didn't mean it, but let's be honest. Wrestling fans, as a rule, like to see hot girls showing skin. Right? Sure. Is that fair to say? Then we had the baby faces saying they didn't want to do what the fans wanted. Yeah. That's dumb. <laughs> so then they had the match, and yes... It was fucking awful. I watched the show on my own. Thank you over watched it with you, which means I had to watch this twice. 
all I don't even know. They stalled forever. They each <laughs> the winter, with the turnbuckles. The winter brook dosy do of I, doom. I, I, <laughs> I need an animated GIF of everything that happens immediately after Brooke doing the stink face in the corner. After that, up to the point where Brooke hits a drop kick. Yeah. The, the following ten seconds is the worst ten second rope spot of 2011. Yeah. Uh, even before that, though, they all took turns posing on the corners, and there's six of them, so it took forever. Then they tried to do a big group pose on the corners, and you should have seen Tara and Tessmacher and Velvet trying to coordinate themselves in a position to get this, where Tara headed for one corner, and Velvet said no, and shouted, shouted loudly, you go that way. And then she realized that she was supposed to go that way, so she went that way. Then they tried to pose for the uh, the non-hard camera side, like they were going to pose for the stage. Then they wrestled. Taz made a reference to Helen Keller's underwear. I don't know. Eventually, Madison grabbed a belt. Mickey stopped her, and uh, Velvet pinned Madison. This is a very, very bad match. I would say... You should have seen <laughs> the fucking backcracker. Or, or whatever, whatever the hell it was that Madison tried to do on Velvet in the last minute of this match. I've never seen a move performed in a slower manner, and that's including instant replay slow motion. I would say this match is worth going out of your way to see because it was so bad. Yes. Whatever the negative star rating would be. Negative four stars, I guess. I don't know if I'd go that far. But, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. But whatever the star rating we is, the pay same. for it. This is so bad, you must see it. That's what star rating this gets. We pay for it with parts of our life, but that's it. <laughs> but I don't regret it. It was bad enough to be fun. In a, oh my god, this is a bad kind of way. We got a shot of uh, Jeff Hardy strolling down the hallway. He was alone in a hallway. He was wearing a hooded sweatshirt, a Jeff Hardy t-shirt, and what appeared to be a painted Batman mask. They told us it was Jeff Hardy. And he was strutting down a hallway. And I thought, what the hell is this idiot doing? <laughs> you know what's funny about this? is like, he comes down to the ring, I think in the very next segment. Yes. There was a bit of Karen yelling at the women... Okay, but. yeah, that is the thing. Next week, she's going to choose her outfit. So, Jeff comes down to the ring, and, like, literally within one second of him being on the ramp, I immediately knew it wasn't Jeff Hardy. And uh, it turned out it was Jeff Jarrett. It took me about one second after he walked down on the ramp to realize, okay, this is a fella doing, I can't even say a Jeff Hardy impersonation. This is a person making fun of Jeff Hardy. I can't even say that. This is a, this is like a really, really drunk guy on Halloween dressed up as Jeff Hardy and doing a better impersonation. Wouldn't that be Jeff Hardy? It could be. But the point is, I knew immediately when he came out on the ramp, but during the backstage segment, I didn't know. And the reason for that is because I put nothing past Jeff Hardy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. This, this guy doing this goofy strut, wearing a goofy outfit and a goofy mask, I was like, yep, that could be Jeff Hardy. Yeah. This was uh, the opposite of when CM Punk dressed up as Jeff Hardy. And it actually fooled people until they started to talk. This was... I mean, the fans are going crazy, but if you watch this, this is a... This is someone half-assing a Jeff Hardy impression and, and making fun of Jeff. And he'd stop and do his wacky little dance in a completely unenthusiastic manner. And he would slap hands as if, well, he was stoned. Then he got in the ring and he pulled off his mask. And it was Jeff Jarrett. He had a big laugh. He said he didn't know why people liked Hardy. Maybe because he had wore makeup like a circus clown. Maybe because he cut dynamic promos. He said it was a de degenerate, pathetic, worthless, low life with no business in the company. Maybe the fans loved him because they could relate to that. Said maybe the fans would grow up and so they could embarrass and humiliate the company you worked for. At this point, Jeff Hardy ran out to attack him. And Janae said Hardy could take no more of this crap. What crap? The truth? So, Mortal made the save. Then all the baby faces ran the save. It was exactly like the opening segment. And somewhere in here, apparently, and I did not figure this out until later, but apparently we were supposed to get the impression that Jeff Hardy had been injured in this segment. I saw him go down, but I've seen him go down a million times. It looked like a guy going down in a brawl, yeah, like in every segment on Impact, actually. We got the turkey suit highlight video. This is shots of men like Alex Shelley and AJ Styles throwing tantrums as they put the turkey suit on on Thanksgiving's past. You asked a great question. Was this awesome or was this terrible? I don't know. I do know that I am relieved they did not explain that the turkey suit used to go to the person who finished second in the tournament. Mm -hmm. 
Then we have the turkey soup match. <laughs> Robbie E versus Eric Young. Yeah. I actually went back on my own and l- watched this entire segment twice just to listen to Taz. Taz was awesome. A selection of what he said. First, he just commented on what his career had come to, and he, <laughs> he just trailed off and didn't finish the sentence. As Eric Young was attacking Robbie with a turkey suit, Taz said, A turkey head on the fist. I don't know what I'm saying. Robbie E. then began to attack the turkey suit. He was stomping it and punching the head, to which Taz said, Homeboy, you're beating up a stuffed turkey. And uh, they kept going on. The ref tried to get rid of the turkey suit, but then a pinfall happened, which led to the ref counting the pin with the turkey suit on his hand as if the turkey was banging its own head against the mat, to which Taz cried out, What the hell is going on here? What is this? This is the strangest thing I've ever called. Shortly thereafter, he noted, look at the ref. He's doing a turkey dance. So they were so busy watching the turkey dance that they did not notice that Robbie E. had gotten a weapon of some kind. Yeah, that was, by the way, let me let me explain here. Rudy Charles, as, as uh, his buddy Eric Young is making a comeback, Rudy Charles is so excited about this comeback that he begins doing a turkey dance facing the ramp. That was the ref distraction. The ref spontaneously decided he was going to do a turkey dance to celebrate the comeback of Eric Young. It's tremendous. This is presumably why this man is unemployed. This is awesome. So he's doing a turkey dance facing the ramp, not paying any fucking attention to the match. And Robbie E. gets what appears to be a piece of PVC pipe. And he clobbers Eric Young with it, who takes a preposterous bump, given this is a piece of PVC pipe. Robbie E. then proceeds to put the PVC pipe in his armpit. In the oldest pro wrestling trick in the book, I fell in love with this match. Oh, yeah. He puts it in his armpit, and of course, the referee goes away, raises his hand, and the gimmick falls out of the armpit, and the ref goes, Wait! Robbie E! And he begins vigorously pointing and shouting at Robbie E. from across the ring. He doesn't go up to Robbie E. No. He doesn't go over and spin around. No. From across the ring, he's screaming, hey, hold on a second. Wait. And so Robbie E. turns around and Rudy Charles holds up the PVC pipe. At which point, have you ever seen like Ric Flair sell for a finger point from Hulk Hogan? Where Hogan points a finger at him and and Ric Flair uh, almost takes a bump. His eyes grow wide. His hands go up. He begins to shake. He looks back and forth. He begs off. This is exactly what Robbie E. did with his crazy haircut. And, of course, the referee restarts the match. And uh, Eric Young immediately gets pinned with the pile driver. Robbie E. was a god. (laughs) A god of wrestling in this match here. He was so awesome. I am honestly not certain that Ric Flair ever had a, ever had a freak out this great. And this, this this was stupendous. It wasn't even the freak out, but after the match was restarted and he started doing his goofy dance, and then after he got uh, hit with the pile driver and he did his goofy cell job, he did something else like this at one point. I can't even remember when. But uh, Robbie E is officially my favorite wrestler in the world today. That's, I cannot argue. I claim it one bit. No. An astoundingly awesome man. I love Robbie. He was, I, I, I want to break down like every body motion he made upon seeing the referee holding his weapon. Yeah. It, it, he used every muscle from his toes to his neck. Yeah. And in fact, to more, his hair. To his hair, because his eyes were, yeah. It, uh, outstanding, this man. And, uh, and the other great thing about this spot is, you know, the heel is so stupid. That he puts the weapon under his armpit and then forgets it's there immediately. Yeah, of That's course. great. Yeah. That's great. Because he's an idiot heel. Right. This was great. This was a thumbs up. We'll but then say. after the pile driver, he was rendered uh, unconscious. And so oh, yeah. Rob Terry had to put on the, the chicken suit. And and he did. And he did. They chased Eric Young away. He was a good sport. How was that? <laughs> it was, well, they, they explained. Uh, not, uh, the ref said that if... Uh, if Robbie, if Rob Terry wouldn't put the t- turkey suit on, then Robbie E would be stripped of the TV title. So Rob Terry took one for the team. He put the turkey suit on. Yep. Got a segment backstage with uh, Eric Young and Rudy Charles where Eric wanted to train for next Thanksgiving to make sure he never had to wear the turkey suit again. And it ended with Rudy Charles riding a bike into a truck. Uh, that part was not funny, but 
I got a kick out of Eric's message where he looked at the camera as he's running. They put like the camera in the middle, and he ran in circles around it. He just looks in the camera and says, "I hope you all, I hope you all uh, have a safe and the best Thanksgiving ever." <laughs> I don't know I don't, why. I don't have a safe, but maybe I need to get one. It made me laugh. So we had the main event. And it took us a while to figure out what this is, but it was Bully Ray, Chris Daniels, Jeff Jarrett, and Bobby Roode against AJ Styles, Rob Van Dam, Mr. Anderson, and James Storm. No, excuse me, and uh, Jeff Hardy. So I'm still confused. Now, Hardy had been taken out earlier, so it was four on three. And Rude started the match doing commentary, which made it three on three. And just to complicate things even further, Kurt Angle and James Storm were at ringside. This was a clusterfuck. It took me forever to figure out what was going on. Survivor Series elimination match. A week after Survivor Series. Not even four days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they didn't call it that, but I mean, that's what it was. Yeah. It's fine. It was, it, a, it was, it was pretty good, It was actually. a fun TV main event. Yeah. He had a... Uh, Anderson got into trouble, and so Rude ran down, tagged himself in, and got a flash pin because he's, you know, the selfish champion. And then, which a- by the way, his partners didn't care about at all. No, they support his selfish behavior, even if it's at their expense. Sure, well, they help the team win because his psychology is stupid. Well, that too. But uh, then AJ and uh, Rude brawled, and as soon as Rude got in trouble, he just hit a low blow right in front of the ref to get himself DQ'd. Wanted no more part, part of this match. And it came down to uh, AJ Styles versus Bully Ray. That's what I got. Angle and Storm brawl to the back. It was AJ versus Bully Ray, Chris Daniels, and Jarrett, three on one. Mm-hmm. Yes. At this point, out came Jeff Hardy zipping up his pants. <laughs> he was. <laughs> or so, taking off his belt. I wasn't sure. I Whatever. But yes, he, uh, he, he ran down. He was the missing, missing fourth guy. And then he made his big comeback. And... Uh, he pinned. He pinned somebody immediately with a twist of fate. He pinned Daniels with a twist of fate. He went for one on Jarrett and didn't get him, but then pinned him with a small package. Then AJ tagged back in and immediately pinned uh, Bully Ray with a flying forearm. So your survivors are AJ and uh, Jeff Hardy, and then Bobby Roode ran out to kill them, and he laid them out, and that was the end of the show. <laughs> 